days of of it being all about security and and supervision are you know those days are over it's not how the courts work it's not how our missions are 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 aligned <clears throat> so we've been we've been trying to um get a little proactive we we've done this forever but we've really doubled down lately with we're fortunate in Southeast Iowa that we have Western Illinois University, which is one of the top three law enforcement schools in the nation uh, in Macomb, right across the river. And then we also have Iowa Wesleyan College in Mount Pleasant that has a criminal justice program and William Penn University in Oskaloosa, uh, as well as Indian Hills Community College and Southeastern Community College in Ottumwa and Burlington respectively. So, we have been making a big push to be a part of uh, their programs. Uh, we recently presented at Iowa Wesleyan College and we're going to be at Western Illinois next week. Um, one of the things, the different things that we're looking at is uh, having paid internships because that might be the carrot on the stick that gets the people in our door to actually see what we do and then get them more interested in our business. Um, it's very difficult right now to get uh, people off the streets, basically cold call applications when police departments and other agencies are offering five to $10,000 sign-on bonuses. I mean, we're not at that point yet, but I can tell you, I know the DOC is discussing it and uh, the district directors have discussed it many times and what we can do to either um, you know, have a sign on bonuses or retention bonuses at certain benchmarks to make ourselves, you know, to put ourselves in a better position to compete for those, uh, you know, the top level people. So it's a work in progress. It's uh, something that we're all, um, you know, cognizant of as far as the importance. And uh, I have uh, in my the leadership team in the eight district, they um, all have been assigned to not only go out and speak to uh, these junior colleges and colleges and even do some high school programs, but they've also been assigned to go to uh, community stakeholders, basically leaders in our communities, whether it's a preacher or a pastor or someone who runs a, a nonprofit program, et cetera, and to actively recruit. Uh, years ago, people came to us, and now it, we're finding that we have to go and seek them out. And um, so far, it's uh, it's working a little bit better, but we've got a long ways to go. Um, and like I said, I think Sally's going to talk about some efforts later. But uh, with that, I'll wrap up, and uh, thank you for coming to the internet today. Uh, hopefully, you can come to either the Atomo Residential Facility or our Burlington Facility someday, and and, uh, you know, it'd just be a chance to broaden your horizons and, and also see the difference in some facilities out there. Uh, the difference between or a Tumwa and Burlington one is, is stark because of just uh, the 40 year gap in the, the time when the buildings were built. So but anyway, always glad to have you. Appreciate the work you're doing. And with that, I would uh, answer any questions if you have them. Thank you for your welcome. I guess I have a question. Um, I understand the need and it's a great relationship with the schools. Does the department do any kind of um, statistics on the average uh, work? I'm not articulating this well, but the average number of years of experience and if we get too many kind of new students in our, our years of experience will go down and does that correlate with safety in the in the institutions or how do you handle that if we're not able to get the personnel coming in with say 10 or 20 years experience well my experience i won't speak for the department of corrections is but my experience is that it's not so much the uh, being a new employee or an older employee. The, the issue is the gaps. So currently we, in our workforce, we have 
you know, a high percentage, and I can't quote it for you, but of staff that are in that five to 10 year range of being able to retire. And then after that, we have, you know, newer staff that have five or 10 years on. So you create these gaps that widen, and then your experience base is going to go down. Um, now, it doesn't mean that those newer employees or the more senior ones are, are better than the other. It's just that the, the better mix that we get uh, of, of, of staff, whether it's by uh, diversity standards or whether education or prior experience, you know, right now we're not only trying to actively recruit criminology students, we're looking at sociology, psychology, uh, liberal arts, because we're finding that we can teach them how we do business and how we need to. We just need really squared away people that care about what we're doing. And those come from all facets of education. Uh, it's not the old, you know, you can either be a cop or you can be in corrections type thing. So we're trying to expand that as well to to, to kind of get some new thought processes going on about the way we do business. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, I think you're going the right direction with the paid internships. It's a great way to get in the door and get some commitment. Thank you. Agree. Any other questions? All right. Seeing or hearing none, I will, Sally's in the hot seat as director today, so I will turn it over to you, Sally. I think Joanna's going to throw some slides up for you. Um, while she does that, I can give you the first part. Well, welcome. Sorry we couldn't meet in person. Hopefully we will be able to do that soon. Um, the first thing we'll just cover is our population updates. We do that usually every time. And again, since March 1st, 2020, we've had 3,299 parolees and 1,265 work release clients released. And the prison count has declined by 637. Um, and then since March, the Board of Parole has done 19,752 reviews and we have about a 40% approved release um, right from those individuals. So, you know, I, this is where I do want to do a quick shout out since it's, since I get to have the floor, um, community-based corrections has done a phenomenal job in the number of, um, individuals that they've kept in the community. When you consider the fact that, uh, most of their referral sources went down by 40%, you know, most places are still operating anywhere between 60 and 75%. Um, instead of doing the easy Thing, which would be, you know, ask for a revocation, they have just worked and worked and worked to build relationships and to find other resources and places for, for clients that are in crisis that are out on the streets. So I just really want to give them a public shout out for all the hard work. They've always done a really nice job and um, people in Iowa aren't revoked for missing one appointment. It's usually, you know, it's an ongoing public safety issue, but they have really become creative and flexible. So I just want to, I want to give them a public shout out for all the different things that they've done. Um, the next one that we'll just talk about to our COVID updates, we have four offenders who are positive, um, 17 staff, 85% of our prison population is fully vaccinated and 58% um, of our prison staff are fully vaccinated. I wanted to bring this up because we have a lot of staff that are here at the Iowa Corrections Association. I think in the past we've um, had board meetings there and if you guys are interested in doing that, we can resume that again. But the Iowa Corrections Association meets usually twice a year in the spring and in the fall. The spring, um, the spring conference is nice because they recognize uh, people who for different um, awards and we'll go through those in a minute. Uh, but they also do a memorial for staff that have lost their lives during the year. Uh, we didn't. We did decide to hold off and um, do the memorial services for Lorena Schulte and Bob McFarland next spring uh, because it'll be in Waterloo, and that location is just better for the family. So when you see the memorials and you see that they're not on there, that that decision was made 
very purposefully. But the other thing that I'm going to say is the Iowa Corrections Association, um, it's staff and it's not part of their jobs. It's things that they do to volunteer on their off time. They go and find training, CEUs, all sorts of things. And it's, it's very, very uh, inexpensive. They figure out ways to provide training that way. And it's just nice for people to build rapport and get to know one another. I think um, technology is wonderful. We've all enjoyed not having to drive, no offense, Dan, to a Tamwa for a couple hour meeting or what have you. But I do see that um, that face-to-face building relationships and building rapport is also invaluable. We, we talked about this in the past. You have an individual who's being released from prison and um, you're trying to work through those issues. It's much easier for me to call Becky Williams, who I know personally, and talk about that case versus someone I've never met. So it's, it's not only very, very good training, but it's also nice networking and it, it's a good way for us to help build our, our leaders for the next um, generation. This shows you the awards. The award ceremony was held last evening. Um, the, I'm not going to go through this. Um, I'm not going to, I'll try to not bore you, but <laughs> I think it's good for you to see what these awards are. The Lowell Brandt ICA member mm-hmm. is the member that has contributed um, consistently to the mission of um, ICA. The Larry Brumeyer Award is to recognize someone who's done exceptional leadership. And Jay Nelson, who is our recently retired warden, um, he was honored with that, which was um, which was fun to see. Janet Barrett is she works at um, Rockwell City. Our outstanding correctional program is the Waterloo Mental Health Reentry Unit. They've done some really good work, and so if you guys ever would like to have a presentation on the work that they've done, um, I think you would find it interesting. I don't think you guys have had a presentation on that, but I could be wrong. Um, Outstanding citizen, that's given to a private citizen who does not work for corrections that has contributed to our mission and um, Kingdom Living. They have been a huge resource for us always, but even during COVID, the number of, um, they've just handled COVID professionally and, and it's been a good resource for us. The outstanding public official is just that, a public official that's contributed to our mission. Dr. Amy Zarling, um, she works for Iowa State University. She is the one that helped develop our new domestic violence program, and she's done a lot of research in that area. I think what's really, um, what we've really enjoyed about Dr. Zarling is not only is she looking at domestic violence, but trauma-informed care. It's a pretty new um, thing, and a lot of people are talking about it, but she's um, contributed not only to Iowa, but nationally. Um, People have benefited from the research that she's done. Um, We put in a recommendation to honor all of our SVSS folks for outstanding victim assistance. We talked about this last meeting. You know, they just did a phenomenal job while even they are hurting, they reached out and helped their coworkers and their peers. So it was nice to see that they were honored. And then the last award is Outstanding Women in Corrections. And there's a group from ICIW, Courtney Erringdale, Mike Lessing, David Southwick, who were um, honored for the work that they've been doing with trauma-informed care. This is a program too that I think it would be good for them to present to the board. They're getting national recognition for this program. And I know enough to be dangerous, so I'd rather have you guys hear about it from them. But again, what we're hoping is, is if there's some things that are of interest to the board that you'd like to hear about, please let us know and we will we'll get it on the agenda for you. Um, we go from this big awards banquet where it's really fun and nice to um, honor and recognize folks into our memorials. And it's just a really nice time for us to grieve and to um, recognize the people that have worked for corrections. We had um, Mike Teach out from Clarenda, Rich Hutton from Newton, RJ Vitamos, and Kelly Jones, both from ICIW, and um, Robert Henderson. Oh, and Sydney Stenicka. If they're still ICA members, even though they've retired, we recognize them as part of the memorial service. All right, is there any questions about ICA or I can just answer them all at the end as well? I have a couple. Um, The Citizen Award, is she from Polk County or where 
where does she do her work or is it across Iowa? Um, I think that program, I know, is anybody from the fifth district on? I, I think Jesse's actually a male and I think, and I know Kingdom oh. Living, they have a um, house in Des Moines. They may have places elsewhere too, but is there anybody that knows more about this than, than me? <laughs> Okay. Well, and I just curious, yeah. not necessary. Um, and as far as the ICAC, um, what would it look like if we piggybacked a board meeting with that? How would that be easy to do or would it cause complications? Well, there's a couple of things that we could use. It is a public meeting. And I remember this is probably 20 years ago, um, the board during right during the conference the board just had their meeting and um, people that were attending the conference could just sit in and and observe the board meeting so I thought that was kind of a, a nice thing to do we've also done it where the board just meets off in another room kind of at an off time so no I think that's something I mentioned it briefly to the um, ICA group yesterday if they would be interested in the past the district directors and wardens have had their meetings there as well um, so it would be something that if you guys are interested, I, I'm pretty sure we could get that accomplished. And then of course, if you wanted to attend the rest of the, um, conference, so you could get to know staff and, and hear a little bit more about some of the things that are going on. I think that might be a nice opportunity. Okay. Thank you. And I would just put my vote in right now to get trauma informed care on an agenda in 22. It doesn't matter when, but I'm yeah. very interested in that research. And I, th I think it seems to show great potential. I, I would agree. agree. Yes. Yeah. I wrote it down. I agree. Great. The other thing I'll just mention is um, these are tentative, but like I said, next spring, will be in Waterloo. And then the plan is in the fall, a year from now, it'll be at Honey Creek Resort. And then the following spring in 2023, it'll be in Cedar Rapids. Um, we did not, we missed quite a few ICA conferences because of COVID. So uh, the hotel industry was just wonderful about working with us and helping us to um, reschedule those and figure those things out. So anyway, we do have a, we do have them scheduled out for quite a while, but again, we'll, we'll, we'll send information to you about those. So you guys can make okay. sense. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the next part, just, we thought it might be a nice time since, um, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't some pressing issues like they normally is, like if you have to vote on the budget or legislative proposals and that kind of thing, to just cover for you some things that have been going on. Um, we are back, we are back in full swing. There is a lot of things going on right now and it's very, very busy. And so um, we asked uh, the wardens and the district directors to send to us any information that we could share with you all. Um, the biggest thing that we're dealing with right now is we're converting to what's called Workday. And we have to all get our timesheets in and approved today by noon. And so I know people are scrambling. It's a good program. It's just whenever it's something new, um, you know, people are trying to figure that out. But Workday, instead of going to several different places to um, and get your benefits, enter your timesheets, um, put in your expenses, et cetera, it's now in one spot. So... Um, I know for the last month or so, people have been doing training. They've been trying to figure out the system. It's, um, that's a big deal to us, at least. So we thought it was worth mentioning just because it's a new system. Um, on an exciting note, uh, Newton crisis negotiation teams took third place. There were, uh, gosh, I believe, I think they gave me some good notes here, 12 teams that competed. This is that competition where it's, uh, where there's day long hostage scenarios. And then they just practice their skills to be able to um, get through that. And, and again, they took third place. Um, at ISP, our canine sergeant, Mike Barnes, and his canine partner got 13th out of 70 teams um, in the um, competition for the uh, 
national canine competition. So that was, uh, that was fun to see. Um, we're going to be having emergency preparedness, tactical training at ISP. I believe it's next week. And um, our communications director, Nick Crawford, uh, joined our team a couple of weeks ago. And if it would be appropriate and okay, can we have him hop on screen real quickly and introduce himself? Would that be okay? That would be great. Thanks. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Can, can you all hear me okay? Yep. Great. Um, my yeah. name is Nick Crawford. I'm the new communications director board members. It's, it's great to meet all of you virtually. Hopefully sometime here in the near future, I can, I can meet you all in, in person as well. Um, I'm just really excited to be on board. Um, like I said, looking forward to, to working with each of you, keeping you all updated. Um, I'll see if I can uh, circulate my contact information to you all. So you all have my email address and my phone number and everything. Um, but yeah, like I said, very, very excited to be here. Looking forward to, to working with you all and uh, just appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. All right. So I don't know if you noticed there in my office, if I sit for too long, my lights go off. So I just had to go run and turn them back on. So if I also go dark, that's what's going on. Um, here's some other activities that have been going on. This is prime, this is in Clorinda. Um, you can see they, they had a report free um, state cookout for incarcerated individuals. Um, it's tied to positive behavior. If they go a year without a major report, then they're able to um, participate in this event. We had 225 incarcerated individuals that went report free for a whole year. So that was kind of a, that was kind of a nice event for them to have and, and something that we haven't been able to do for a while due to COVID. Um, we were able to figure that out. Clorinda also uh, hosted a surprise hot dog cookout for their staff. Um, and you can see there's the warden being dunked in a dunk tank. They use that for a fundraiser for activity funds. I'm never sure why this is, but it when one of us sits in that dunk tank, it seems to really encourage people to spend their money and add. <laughs> but he was a good sport about it, and staff had they had a they had a good time. And then some of you have been to Clorinda to see the B. The B program, the B Haven program is what it's called, but we just, that's still alive and well. Um, they did over 400 bottles of honey and um, they'll, they're not done yet with the season. I didn't know this, but apparently bees have a season as well. Um, but we again have incarcerated individuals who um, participate in this and um, you guys met him, I believe, Correctional Officer Gerald Nelson. He oversees the program. And as a little bit of background, um, Deputy Director uh, Randy Gibbs is the one that started this program. And the, this bee, bee, uh, the bee honey goes to the food banks, retirement homes, conferences, staff, and then um, those that are incarcerated can purchase it if they want as well. So kind of a fun program. And again, once we get back to Clorinda, you guys, or you can take a tour at any time and take a look, but it's kind of a nice program. The 6th District, um, they actually had a ribbon cutting with, um, you can see uh, Adam Gregg, our Lieutenant Governor, and um, Director Skinner was there. This is um, a program with the Wenzel Center and the RISE program. And I asked what this stood for because I, I didn't know. Reintegration Initiative for Safety and Empowerment. So there's a Lynn County Group Recidivism Committee um, that operates under Fresh Start Ministries. And what this program does is if you are an individual who would like some help with positive changes, you can go to this center and there's local resources like housing, employment, transportation, social services, other basic needs. Um, so it was nice to see the Lieutenant Governor there. It's been, um, Sixth District does a really nice job in collaborating with their community in finding resources for folks. And I think I don't mean to put him on the spot, but I think Bruce, uh, the director for the sixth is actually on if you guys have specific questions about that program, but we're excited to see that they were able to, to um, get that opened, especially during COVID. Uh, 
All right. This is Mount Pleasant for those of you that have been there. Um, they, the first picture shows a, a check for $1,200. They've done this three times. Um, and it's with uh, those that are incarcerated. It's from their donations of pop bottles. What they have in, in Mount Pleasant is they have different boxes set around. And then once they have a soda, they can decide, you know, which, which thing it should go to. And this goes to an elementary school so that um, kids that can't afford it can have milk with the rest of their peers. So it's kind of a fun um, program and it's nice that we're able to do that. And again, they've done that three times. We've had three $1,200 uh, donations. Um, the one below is we just wanted to make you aware of, there's a new partnership with WineGuard. It's a Burlington company that makes satellite dishes for Dish Network. And they've moved a portion of their manufacturing line to our IPI building on grounds. So you can see there's some, um, there's some folks working in there. All right, IMCC, they had a pumpkin drive. Um, their, their food drive committee sponsors this and all the proceeds will purchase, will purchase Thanksgiving baskets for um, in the community that are um, not able to do so. So the local schools provide the institution with names of families that would qualify, and then they're able to um, make that donation. So that's kind of a fun thing. The other thing is in May, um, CEO Mitch Sherman and a second officer were escorting one of our folks for an emergency trip. And while they were there, um, a, an emotionally distraught man who actually had a knife um, was seen in the waiting area and CO Sherman actually um, convinced the man to drop his knives and lay on the ground. Um, so we placed him in restraints and held on to him until the police got there and nobody was injured. And so um, I don't believe we shared that with you. We thought this would be a good thing for you guys to be made aware of. Things like this happen quite, I don't want to say a lot, but things like this happen where uh, our officers and the probation parole officers you know, help local law enforcement or do things like this. And I don't know that we always do a good job of letting the board know about that. So um, we just wanted to share with you that specific incident. Um, we still have a dog program at IMCC. They partner with, it's called Retrieving Freedom um, and it trains dogs to be service dogs for children of autism and veterans that have physical or mental health needs. Um, there's three dogs that are in the program right now. There's been many dogs. I don't even know how many that they've um, been able to train and then successfully place in the community. Um, but there's been several programs across the nation that have uh, come to us to learn how to do this based on, based on this program. So I feel like that's a pretty nice win-win. Um, they also have several opportunities to train dogs for community service work. Um, there, there, there are schools that allow dogs for emotional support and therapy dogs, um, children who have experienced sexual assault, um, helps them testify in court. So there is a lot of benefit um, with these dogs in the community and there's a big need for it. So it's nice that this is something that, um, that we can do. I don't know if you remember this, but in July, we had a lot of um, challenging weather again in Iowa, and there was an E3 tornado in Lake City um, that had, there was just extensive, huge, huge damage. So the emergency management um, reached out to us and asked if we could assist them, and Rockwell City uh, had individuals that worked with them to do the cleanup. There were 29 individuals that actually assisted with this, and that was over five days. And we've, we calculate that approximately 242 hours um, of service were, were done during that time. This has been my world the last week. <laughs> Uh, interstate compact is something that central office is responsible for the oversight and then the uh, community based corrections folks um, are the ones that actually supervise unless it's somebody coming out of the prison and I won't go into all of that but um, there twice every other year compact 
votes on new rules or amendments. And um, this was a rulemaking year. So we met again virtually, which was tricky. We had to learn how to vote on the computer and take oaths and all kinds of things. But um, what happens is, is we do have a commission. Um, there's somebody from the judicial branch of victims. Um, we have legislators on this. And whenever there's a proposed rule amendment change, the, our commission gets together, reviews it, and determines if I was going to vote yes or no. I'm actually the one that does it, but it's based on the recommendation of the commission as to whether or not those rules um, are voted on, either yay or nay. All the rules this, this time were passed, um, and there wasn't anything that I would say will really impact our work to a large degree. Anyway, I listed those for you. A good example is they added a district attorney as one of our ex, ex officio members. We have somebody from the victim's world. And I think um, last time we were saying, you know, we really need a district attorney um, to be on that committee to offer that other lens. Um, the one that I, I will point out is uh, ICOTS, that's the Interstate Compact, is much like ICON in that this is a national program. So anybody that's on supervision in another state. So in Iowa, let's say somebody from Minnesota comes down to Mason City, gets arrested, but lives in Minnesota. The compact requires that we transfer that case to um, back to Minnesota because that's where the person lives. And the compact is a way to ensure that um, people are abiding by the same rules. If you if you are will, and it's for public safety. That is the main purpose of the compact. Um, one of the air, we have a really good um, computer program and they're going to start doing audits. So that's a good thing. Um, but things, the audits will help ensure that people are following the rules that are set out by compact. So one of the things are warrants. Those, those are ones that we um, sometimes have some difficulty with trying to track those and make sure that we're implementing them for example. So anyway, that, that happened, that happened this week as well. All right. We wanted to um, let you know that we applied for um, these four individuals to be on the Washington DC official line of duty fallen heroes Memorial. All four have been approved. Um, they, um, we did the paperwork, it's, it's due by December 1st, and then as they review to make sure that the people qualify, um, then they notify us and it goes in, um, then they notify us that they've been approved. And actually next May, out in Washington, D.C., there will actually be a conference and, um, and a memorial service to honor our fallen heroes in Iowa. Um, as you know, Robert McFarland and Lorena Schulte were um, murdered in the line of duty, and they'll be honored. And then um, the other criterion that allows individuals to be on the memorial is if someone is, while um, employed, there's, if they have, if they die from COVID. And we actually, our two staff members that died from COVID, um, Robert Vitimus from um, ICIW and uh, Michael Teachout from Clorenda, um, were approved to be on the wall as well. Um, I, I do think I, I do want to point out that Lorena Schulte, um, because of her job duties, that she had oversight and responsibility for the um, the individuals at Anamosa. She was um, approved to be on the wall. Normally, on the wall, it's um, correctional officers, probation, parole officers, etc. But based on her job duties. Um, the individuals that make that determination felt she should be on that wall as well. So we'll keep you up to date on um, what happens there. And I think you probably saw on the news or whatever that the two involved in, um, inmates both pled guilty to all charges and have been sentenced, which is um, which we were glad to see that. So we can start moving forward. So anyway. Okay, Dan Fell talked a little bit about this earlier, but um, our recruitment and retention efforts 
are in full swing. You can see here's a billboard that is in the Fort Dodge area. Um, and then um, we have, you can see that these are job fairs and different kind of things, but we thought if you have a minute and you're interested, we would play for you a couple of radio ads. Are you interested in hearing those? They're super short. All right, so if you're okay listening to it, I think Joanna, you're, I gotta have you do that. I'm not sure I know how to do that. Our sign up bonus at the Fort Dodge Correctional Facility. Whether you're an experienced nurse or just beginning your career, the Fort Dodge Correctional Facility would love to hear from you. As an RN, your benefits will include great pay, paid leave and holidays, exceptional insurance, I find more. Don't forget that $3,000 sign up bonus. If you to practice nursing in the state of Iowa, this is your chance. Apply now at doc.iowa.gov slash careers. Equal opportunity, affirmative action, employer. Those are coming across, right? Yep. Okay, great. The Fort Dodge Correct Facility is now hiring correctional officers. Whether you're looking for a lifetime career or just a foot in the door for a future in law enforcement, corrections can provide endless opportunities and valuable experience for advancement. Hi, I'm Megan, a correctional officer at the Fort Dodge Correctional Facility, and I invite you to join our team. Building insurance, diverse, and much more. Although you may start as a correctional officer, you may eventually want to become a counselor, a trades leader, or work your way up the security team. The opportunities are open. Check us out today. Apply online at doc.iowa.gov slash careers. That's doc.iowa.gov slash careers. The Poor Docs Correctional Facility is an equal opportunity for action you seem to have a little difficulty, Joanne, it's kind of going in and out, or maybe it's just, is that, was it doing that for everybody else too? Yeah, but you get the gist. Um, I know that the, the Nebraska games, we're going to piggyback back with um, workforce development, and we'll be having some ads on during the broadcast of those, just trying to get to other areas. And I think the other piece that, um, I think every warden, every district director is working with every college around to see, you know, like Dan said, to look for interns. Um, I think some are exploring if they can figure out if they can pay some students to work just the weekend so they can go to school during the week. So they're being really creative and working really hard to get those positions filled. And that's all I have for the director's update, unless there's any questions. Uh-oh. I would just like to thank you and Joanna. Based on the email, I sense that you worked hard and late to get this put together. And it's a delicate balance. I recognize that as a board, we do what we need to do and we cover um, the most critical things going on um, in the department. But I do think we have veered away from learning about the programs. And as board members, I certainly like to be able to go out into the community and you know tell people um, some of the great things going on. So I really appreciate this kind of break in structure um, to get a highlight version. Great, and again, if there are programs that you wanna learn about or there's things that you, that you would like, please let us know and we'd be glad to line that up for each meeting. And I know before we um, had some um, things that we always reported on every meeting and then COVID happened, if you guys have, if there's specific things besides COVID vaccinations and population, um, please let us know that too. And, and that's what we, we're here to give you the information so that you know what we're doing. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Sally, uh, Larry, a uh, quick question. On the COVID cases that you have, um, are any of those breakthrough cases or are, are, are those unvaccinated people that are getting most, you know? 
Joanna, do you, I believe, I don't know on these specifically, but we have had some breakthrough cases. And I don't know if Dr. Morris would want to speak on it, but we have, um, so far we've tracked 16 breakthrough cases for offenders and 26 for staff. Sure, yep, absolutely. Um, yeah, and when we compare our breakthrough cases, they typically have been lower um, severity. So most of our breakthrough cases haven't gotten significantly ill. We did have one uh, incarcerated individual that did have to go to the hospital and did have to be ventilated um, who was a breakthrough case, um, but he had some underlying conditions of COPD and some uh, liver disease as well. So I think that probably contributed to that. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Yep, no problem. Are there any other questions? Seeing or hearing none, um, we would certainly ask for any public comments at this time. I'm not hearing any comments in the chats either. Okay, thank you, Joanna. Um, I have hearing a, none. I, I, have a, I have a comment. This is Larry. I can't seem to get my video working, but anyway. Um, the, the issue on the air quality at the two prisons, Anamosa and um, Mount Pleasant, uh, I know the studies have been done and quotes have been put in for in 2020 and again 2021 to get this air conditioning in those two prisons. And uh, I know that as Dan was saying that you have staffing problems. Well, there was like 20 plus staff and CEOs left at Anamosa. Some of those course administrative problems, but a lot of it was also due to the, the working conditions there. I mean, if you're looking to hire people in and uh, they have to come in for eight hours a day and work in 800 or 100 degree plus weather, that seems to be a deterrent to me. I mean, I wouldn't want to do it uh, with all the other stuff that the staff and, and CEOs have to do. So I just kind of wondered what the plan was for that, if that was going to get put in in this winter so it'd be ready for next spring. And I, as a, a person of the public, is there something as a public person could do to talk to legislators or whatever to get this done so that we don't have this continued problem? problem of air quality and uh, staffing shortages in those two prisons. Thank you for your comment, um, Larry. Our, our typical process with public comments is to take your comment and um, have somebody from the department to answer that at the next meeting. So if you could plan to attend the next meeting, otherwise, um, Joanna, do you have the information you would need if he can't be in attendance that we can respond to him by mail or email or, or some adequate avenue? Uh, well, I'll speak up for that. Joanna has my email address. Mr. Smith? Yes. Okay, yes, I can get in touch with him. Okay. Well, thank you for your comment. And I just want you to know that the department will respond to your concerns. Thank you. Anybody else from the public? Hearing no one, we will go on to open discussion amongst the board members. Um. Yeah, I, I, I became aware of a program that Iowa Public Health is putting together dealing with Alzheimer's and, and dementia. And I'm, I, it, the question came up with corrections, and I'm not sure that you guys can answer this today, but do we have program, you know, we have an aging population within the pr a prison system as well. And uh, do we have programs First off, is, a, is, is it an issue within the correction system? And then do we have programs and educational type situations to deal with it, to recognize it within the corrections department? And Dr. So, Morris, I'll, I'll defer to you. I think you sure. to give the best answer. 
No, I, it's a, it's a great question. I, I wish I could say that I had an answer. Um, it is, we, we certainly have an aging population. We, we talk about this weekly, actually, um, when we come together and kind of talk about patients throughout the entire state. So we have an aging population that do have increased demands, um, both physical and mental, such as dementia. Um, and so uh, currently we have some what's called ADLA workers, and that's people that help. It's, it's incarcerated individuals that help. They get training to then be able to help assist other individuals. And that's worked out pretty well. Um, we have medical units here at IMCC that we will house some of the more uh, complex patients, our long-term ambulatory, um, even our infirmary sometimes. Um, so we do have some facilities and some structure in place for that, but I think we're all aware that the need is, is definitely expanding and I think going to continue to expand into the future. So I, I don't have a good answer for how we will manage that yet, but I do think it is a concern. Yeah, I was just wondering if you have, you know, like uh, people that have contact with your populations to recognize the early uh, symptoms of it, or is that being part of your educational process with corrections officers or with people on the probation? Yeah, no, um, not so much that I'm aware of with the officers themselves. Um, we have everyone, you know, everyone here gets regular physicals, uh, regular follow-up appointments and those kind of things. So I, I think generally they would get picked up by our medical team. <laughs> Um, because of those regular appointments that we have scheduled. Um, but I'm not sure about anything in the, in the correctional officers themselves. Okay. Uh, Sally, uh, I don't know. I don't think uh, public health has been in contact with corrections as best I can uh, determine yet. But I, I, when I talked to him yesterday, and I'm part of a, like a little advisory group, I was asked to be part of an advisory group. And uh, I'm going to advise them to get in contact. Who would be the best person uh, to contact concerning that program um, at Corrections? Beth or somebody else? What do you think, Dr. Morris? Go straight to you or do you want it funneled through Beth? Yeah, I mean, I'd be happy to take a look at it and then I could kind of reach out to Dr. Greenfield and, and then we could review it and bring it to Beth maybe. That's kind of my thought. What do you think, Sally? Is that sound reasonable? Okay, well, it's a three-year program, as I understand it, and it's a program. I don't know all the specifics at this point. They're going to be sending me some information, and maybe I, I'll let me send that on and uh, share it with the department and, so that you're aware of it anyway, and we can, because I think it's, as the population ages, it's going to be something that we have to deal with more and more, so. Absolutely. Nope, I think that's a great idea, and if you don't mind including Dr. Greenfield on that as well. Okay, great. all right. Thank you. Sounds good. Other, Thank, you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board? Trent, I saw you reach, but I don't know if you're going to say something. Okay. All right. Hearing no other comments, I will call for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Webster. Um, all in favor for adjournment? Aye. 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 And those, those Aye. opposed? Aye. All right, those opposed? All right, so those in favor have it. We will adjourn and we will certainly look forward to hopefully seeing everybody in person on November 5th at the central office. Thank you everybody for attending. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.